Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'm Morgan Evans, and I'm here from Autodesk. A warm welcome to you. Hope you've all enjoyed Nordic Games so far. So today, I'm going to be talking to you um, about some of the tools we use for both managing the production of computer games and also creating some of the 3D content. So that will come in the form of Shotgun and Maya. So there's kind of two parts to this presentation. So a little introduction about myself. Um, I've worked in uh, visual effects and film for about 12 years as a rigger. Uh, so I've worked at a number of companies around the world, uh, DreamWorks Animation included, and I specialized in things like facial rigging during that time. So I've been with Autodesk for about a year now, um, and I'm working for their London office as a technical specialist. So the main products that I cover are um, Maya and Shotgun. So before I go into the presentation, um, if you've got your badges still, which I assume you have to, to be getting in and out of the place, uh, we do have a goodie bag that we'll be giving away, so your badge number uh, will have access to your email with that. So if you wish to participate in this, uh, feel free to uh, give us your badge on the way out or stop by the Autodesk booth. So as I said, there's going to be two parts to this presentation. Uh, there's the shotgun side, which is our production management tool, and then Maya. So I'll be kicking things off with shotgun. So I'll give you an overview of what the tool does and then how games companies are using it and, and also uh, film companies as well. So Shotgun was born in production. Uh, so originally it was a consultation project for Disney and it was done for a movie called The Wild. Some of you might remember this one. And the problem that Disney were having at the time was they were really struggling to get their teams to collaborate and manage that flow of assets and shots right the way through production from start to finish. So they brought in a couple of guys. It was uh, Don Parker and Isaac Rubin. And they set about basically developing a tool, so a web-based tool, to allow Disney to have a much more streamlined way of managing their productions. So they created this collaboration tool, which allowed them to both track and review their assets from script to screen, essentially. So Shotgun was born. So after the very successful production of The Wild, they produced the commercial tool, which came in the form of Shotgun. So what is Shotgun and how does it work? So it's a cloud-based tool, as I mentioned. And the three main customers using it are uh, in film, games, and TV. And they all use it in slightly different ways. So the nice thing about Shotgun, which I'll be talking about later, is how you make the tool work for your productions, not the other way around. So you're not forcing your studio to work the Shotgun way. It's heavily customizable, so you can really adapt it to the, the naming conventions and the way you like to work as a studio. So the main way of interfacing with Shotgun is through the web. So it's a cloud-based tool, and it allows people to work, obviously, across multiple sites across the globe. And there's several other ways that we can interact with Shotgun. So with Shotgun, you get a product called RV, which is a media player, so for dealing with high-end footage like 4K, DPX sequences, and uh, it will even include uh, multi-EXRs and that sort of thing to be able to look at all of the layers. Uh, we also have very good integration with several other products on the market. So obviously, there's the Autodesk products, but um, Photoshop, for example, is another one, Houdini. Lots of other products will interact with Shotgun. And this comes in the form of our Shotgun desktop app. So this is uh, what we would call Shotgun Toolkit, and it comes in the form of various plugins for these different applications to allow you to seamlessly interact and track your assets. So you would publish from something like Maya, for example, and it would go uh, to Shotgun. So We'll talk about how that works in a bit more detail later on. And then finally, we have a Python API that allows your developers to be able to run procedures and updates on your Shotgun site directly through the Python code. So obviously, a lot of studios have in-house tools. This is another portal for you to be able to interact with Shotgun. So there's lots of customers using Shotgun around the globe. Uh, I'm sure you recognize some of the names up here. Uh, I worked at Passion Pictures as their rigging soup, so I've used Shotgun in Anger, and uh, it was a very useful tool throughout production. So as I said before, it's a cloud-based tool, and it allows people to work globally. So for instance, uh, in visual effects these days, no single VFX company seems to take 
all the lion's share of the work. It's it's split often by as, as many as nearly 20 companies around the globe. So this is just a prime example of how the work is being dished out these days. And I know a lot of games companies as well are outsourcing work as well. So this is another benefit to a tool like Shotgun. So in film, it's this kind of script to screen mentality. So it's tracking everything right the way through. Oops. In TV, it's more the regenerating the work in multiple seasons of, of TV productions. You're able to track this right the way through. And in games, it's a slightly different approach. It's being able to allow the artists to really interact with the developers. And so we have all sorts of things like uh, Perforce integration. And some of our customers have written their own JIRA integration to be able to link that bug tracking to the actual asset management at the same time. And then other uses for Shotgun as well are things like motion capture and tracking work on film sets. So there's lots of different uses. And as I said, it's heavily customizable. So you can really make of it what you want. So the core message really for Shotgun is being centered on the creative. So there's a lot less time wasted on the admin side of things, you know, lost emails, lost post-it notes, Google Docs, that sort of thing. And it allows everyone to go just that little bit faster, which ultimately will save the company money because there's a lot less wasted time going on. So I've got a short video I'm going to roll now. It's um, by a company called Parasol Island uh, in Germany. And they're just talking about how they're using Shotgun and how it's kind of helped them with their productions. And then I'll be looking at the actual tool itself and, and showing you how it can help you. My name is Philip and I'm one of the four founders and managing partners of Parasol Island. So Parasol Island is a production company working in all different kinds of media. Um, we're a team of roughly 85 people and working in, in all disciplines of film production, post-production, VFX, animation and um, interactive digital. Parasol grew up a lot and we had more artists and more projects simultaneously. The, the time I spent on managing those projects grew over and over and took my whole time of the day. So we were looking into a solution to bring this organization time down so that I can spend my time working on the projects instead of managing them. That was the, the turning point to, to look into something like Shotgun. Before we were using Shotgun, sometimes the artists felt like they're just being given a task they have to do, and then they're getting the next task and the next task. And with Shotgun, they see not only their own shot, but they see the whole project and the whole scope, and so they, they really feel being a part of uh, something bigger and see a project growing and evolving. And I think this is really important for the motivation of every artist. And it also connects freelance people or people working in our Berlin offices and they feel more like working in a team and not just single artist on a project. The Shotgun Review Tool enables us to get rid of email conversations. And this is a good thing because we end up being a lot more efficient and the feedback is much more clear. You can annotate directly within the tool and you can provide uh, comments directly under certain creative assets. And uh, there's a lot yeah, less miscommunications and less mistakes. The problem is always to get the information from one guy to the other and making sure everyone knows what he has to do. And at the same time, being a project manager, you have to keep uh, track of the whole process and, and see what's happening. This has been really hard and um, an ongoing experiment, I would say, before we were using Shotgun. And uh, with Shotgun, we do now have a tool that um, solves uh, this challenge.
communication is the key to a successful project. Without communication, everyone does something, but not the thing. Production companies today face the, the challenge of having to produce more and better content um, in shorter time frames and in shrinking budgets. We take a lot of care how to organize this company and how to be very efficient and which tools to put in the mix. And, and Shotgun really stands out here because it saves us so much time. It allows us to work so efficiently that it actually pays for itself and more than that, it really saves us money in the end. So that kind of gives you a bit of a overview, if you like, as to how people are using it. So there's a few personas I wanted to focus on, and they're different uses for Shotgun. Um, so we've got the manager. Uh, they want to think about Shotgun from the top-down, all-seeing eye kind of level, so they can see what's going on across all departments. Then you've got the artists. They're more um, concerned with their own task tracking and, and what their immediate to-do list involves. Then the supervisors and art directors, they want to look at the review and approval side that we saw in that video. And then finally, you've got your pipeline guys as well who want to be able to interact with Shotgun from a, a technical level. So if you think about a modern pipeline, in, in, and this goes across games, films, it, it's all very much the same software that's being used. You know, it's incredibly complex these days. You know, there's all sorts of departments involved and they all need to communicate with each other. So it gives you the idea of the sort of complexity that we're dealing with these days. So how does it all start with Shotgun? So you would, you would start off simply by uh, getting yourself a login. So as I said, it's a web-based tool. So there's a, there's a free trial you can sign up to, and then that gives you your Shotgun site to get started with. So once you're onto the uh, Shotgun site, you would get a login, and then it gives you uh, access to um, the different parts of Shotgun, so whether it's the projects or the assets and, and you know, the levels for the games and that sort of thing. So we're going to look at the manager to begin with, and we're going to see what they would be looking at within the tool. So they'd be interested in things like the planning of the whole project, the tracking, the, the different tasks that they need to assign to their artists, and then the note taking, and then finally the report, so the analytics at the end of a project to see how long something took versus how long they bid for it. So this is just a, a broad view that we have here at the moment. So it's got all of the different staff and all the projects that they're working on. And then you can see you know, who's on vacation and that sort of thing. And then you can assign the different projects to the staff at this point. So you, this is your very sort of top level view. So you'd see all the projects that are going on within your production at a given point in time. But then from there, they can go in and start to look at the more granular details of the, um, the projects. So the planning side of it is where Shotgun is very, very good, and the tracking. So from an assets point of view, you have this nice sort of thumbnail view to be able to see all of the artwork, whether it's concept art or, or you know, 3D models, ri rigging turntables, that sort of thing. And then each asset has the different departments involved with it. So we see the different columns there. We've got art, art, surfacing, modeling, rigging. And you can change the status of each task um, very easily within the tool. So you can say it's on hold now. And then within each asset, you have this kind of social feed, a bit like you'd see on something like Facebook, where you can see all of the publishes that have gone on from Maya, all the notes that have been made. And anyone assigned to this would get a notification in their inbox. And then the tasks themselves, um, you basically go into an asset, and you can start to schedule your artists their different work. So here we're seeing the different tasks involved in the beach asset. And we're going in, and we're able to um, update this procedurally so that as we move the uh, dates around on the timeline, you see that the numbers are changing there, and you can set up dependencies as well. So based on the order of the tasks, you can see there that it's automatically populated that chart based on the number of duration or the duration and number of days. 
So the note taking is the other very, very good side of Shotgun. So this kind of stops you really having to deal with lots of emails. So you're able to have a very simple way for artists to go into their asset. They can see all the comments that have been made, whether it's the art director or perhaps their, their department supervisor, and they can track all of this stuff very, very easily. And then the review notes is the sort of tools that your coordinators and your producers would be using to be able to sit in with their laptop and they could have this interface up and they could be making these notes as they go along rather than jotting it down on post-it notes and notepads and that sort of thing. All of this is being tracked and it all is just being automatically sent off to the relevant people assigned to that task. So it really does cut out the need for things like your Excel spreadsheets and your Google Docs and your, and your, your email. And then finally, at the end of the project, they might want to pull some of the analytics. So as I said before, if you want to see how long did we actually bid for this task to take versus how long did it really take in reality. So you can customize all the columns here and you can see the information that you want to pick, pick apart at the end of a production. So it really helps you actually manage the financial side of bidding for your next project as well. So the next person we're going to look at is the artist and, and they have a slightly different use for shotguns. So they're more interested in the interaction with other products like Maya and that sort of thing. So here we would go to say one of their tasks. So this is a layout task for this particular racetrack asset. And they can actually then launch into various applications directly from shotgun. So this is done by installing the shotgun desktop app. And then they can launch into Maya from the shotgun site and it is aware of where that scene file lives on your local servers because there's various metadata that is stored on the database telling it where that file lives. So you would launch into Maya, and then in doing that, it triggers Maya to launch in the shotgun environment, so the shotgun plugin is loaded at this point. And these are some of the other tools that also support toolkit. So this is our out-of-the-box kind of mini pipeline, if you like, for dealing with this. And you can, as I said before, you can do the Python API side to if you want to heavily customize it. So here, this is our shotgun loader. So we're just going to add an extra piece of um, uh, prop into this. So we've got a concrete barrier we want to put into our racetrack. So we're going to bring that in. And we can do this either as a reference model or a simple import. So this is still kind of using backend Maya stuff at this point. And then when we're done with this, we can save the file and we can actually publish it back up to Shotgun. And in publishing, what's happening is we're sending some metadata so we can do like thumbnail screen grabs of our uh, scene. And there's various additional modules that we can add to this. So we have uh, the submit to Perforce, for example. That's one of our additional modules that we um, include as part of the uh, toolkit because we understand a lot of customers are using this. And you can customize this as well so you can add your own tools as part of this. But the overall UI is our out-of-the-box solution. So you would add your comment, you would add your thumbnail, and then this information would go back up to Shotgun, and it would show up in whoever's inbox is assigned to that task. So perhaps the next person or the next department that's relevant would get that notification. So you can launch into, um, say, a texturing task with Photoshop in the same manner. So we offer toolkit support for Photoshop as well. So there's all sorts of tools in place to really just cut out some of that manual process and tracking these assets throughout production from start to finish. And the other nice thing to Toolkit is we have a very consistent UI across all the tools that actually uh, we support. So you can see here there's a very similar look and feel. So you can have this shotgun panel actually embedded within uh, your package that you're using. And it allows you to keep tabs on all of the activity that's going on within Shotgun without even having to leave uh, Maya in this case. So the other side to Shotgun is a re review and approval side. So we're going to look at the uh, director stroke supervisor in this case. And they would want to be able to review what's going on with the artwork, whether it's you know cinematics or whether it's a walk cycle of the rig in this case. So we've got some assets that have kindly been given to us by uh, Digit Pictures from the Witcher team. And what this tool allows you to do, whether you're on the go or, or on, your, on your iPhone, we'll, we'll see in a minute, you're able to go in, you're actually able to annotate the artwork, whether it's moving footage or just concepts, stills. 
you can go in and in this case we're saying right let's make the teeth a bit more pointy so then this information again is going to go back to the relevant artist and in doing this it, you can see it's added that thumbnail to the note there so you're able to then do a very simple way of giving that feedback to the artist and you can add multiple thumbnails to the same footage so say we want to say right let's make these god rays a little bit brighter and a bit wider we can start to scribble on there i didn't have a wacom unfortunately which is why my lines are a bit wobbly i was using the mouse but it's this kind of review and approval side that is a really strong part of shotgun and allows you to just give that feedback to artists in the simplest form possible so this would then show up in the activity feed for the project and then as i said we've got an iphone app as well so you can keep tabs of this on the go and we have some basic annotation tools not not the full suite that we saw there um, but you can do your little scribbles you can add additional um, photos from your phone as well so say you want to give a point of reference so the clouds in the background there we'd like to add something a little bit more interesting we can take a picture so this really moody sky nothing to do with Google images on my laptop and then you can see it's attached it there as an image on the, the on the um, iPhone so then you can add the note we want to brighten the moonlight and increase the clouds a bit and then we refresh and you see that that information is already showing up in shotgun so the other side to shotgun is the uh, client review so uh, this is also valid for perhaps reviewing um, IPs with third parties say you're a, a car racing game and you need to go to the car, manuf car manufacturer they can actually access the stuff on your shotgun site without them needing a shotgun license. This is a way of you giving them a portal, so a URL uh, that can be password protected, timestamps so it can disappear after, say, a given point, a given number of days. And then you can email a playlist, and that could be anything from 3D turntables of your models, um, walk cycles, that sort of thing. And this could be sent off to perhaps a director off site or a third party. And then finally, we've got the pipeline guy as well. So we've got the Python API, and this allows your um, R&D guide to be able to really get under the hood and completely integrate Shotgun with your own custom tools. So I'm going to skip this slide uh, just a little bit. This is our media player. So this is RV. This comes with um, Shotgun, but I'm keeping a note on the time here. I've got about 20 minutes left, so about halfway through. But uh, this is the free media player that comes with Shotgun, and it just allows you to load your 4K images, and you can compare different tracks and that sort of thing. But this is probably more relevant to film than games, but it's good to know that you get this as part of the Shotgun license. So as I said, the main core to Shotgun really is just being centered on the creative. So this brings me to the second part of my presentation. So I'm going to take a bit of a tangent now, but we're going to go into some of the newer features of Maya and, and look at what's come out over the last year. So one of my favorites, so my background is rigging, is uh, the introduction of the um, quick rig tool in Maya. Let's check that this is playing. No, it's not. And this allows you to basically select the mesh and uh, in doing that, you can select all the meshes. It doesn't have to be a single mesh. And you can hit this auto rig button on our quick rig tool now. So what this does is it analyzes the geometry. So it's designed to work with biped characters. It figures out where to put the joints. And it also does the skinning for you with our ge uh, geodesic voxel binding skinning, which is a, a very efficient um, out of the box skinning algorithm. So you can see it's done a really good job at uh, just setting them up and it's uh, fully compatible with our human IK. So this is our content browser. This allows you to be able to just uh, hover over and it has animated thumbnails. So this is great for sort of browsing through motion capture clips and that sort of thing. And so we can bring in some motion capture now. We hit play and we've got Gerald doing a silly, silly dance. Now, after a few customer visits showing this tool off, people saying, oh, does it work for anything else? And I said, oh, no, it's meant to work with biped characters. But they insisted on me trying it with this dinosaur. So I thought, well, we'll give it a go. So it's not strictly a T-pose character. But you can see here, I've run it in this step-by-step -step mode instead this time. So it figures out where to put the joints. It hasn't quite done as good a job there with the elbows. But you can go in, and in this step-by-step -step mode, you can just 
tweak those joints a little bit to figure out or refine where you want those joint positions to go. So we do our little refinements here, and then we recreate the skeleton and we recreate the skinning. And you'll see even with a character like this, it does a pretty good job of doing this. So this, this is a very fast way for you to be able to rig up your characters and then be able to get some motion capture on them. So there's our silly dinosaur. It didn't figure out that he's got a tail. It's not that clever, but it's just quite a fun little showpiece. So we've had big updates to our uh, UV tool sets, uh, uh, especially in update three, which came out, I believe, in April this year. And what's new to the UV tool set is we've got a whole new UV toolkit. So this has all of your um, tools in one place to be able to map out where you want your cuts and, and things to go on your characters. So we'll see here, if we take this head, we're going to put a planar UV on it to begin with, and we're going to start to unwrap so that then you could apply like a skin texture to this character. So traditionally, this would all have been done in the UV editor in, in a 2D kind of workflow or in other tools as well. But now we have the ability to be able to do these cuts and, and choose where you want your different panels to go directly in the 3D viewport. So we've added our planar UV here, and then you can see we're starting to make our cuts now in the 3D viewport. And as I click a loop there, you can see it's changing color, and that means it's basically assigned a new shell to that particular image. So this video is going to be a bit sped up now, just in the interest of time. But you can see that as we add those cuts, they're all changing color. So it's basically allowing you to chop up this mesh. And then we have a great unfold tool now that then can flatten this all out and give you nice, tidy UVs. So really what this new toolkit allows you to do is to just position stuff in a very simple manner. So there's lots of shortcuts in our Transform tab here to be able to position and move your shells into an organized fashion. So we have um, lots of tools in the toolkit as well to allow you to be able to match UVs as well. So we, we have something called uh, Snap and Stack, and that allows you to select a single vertice on one shell of UVs, a vertice on another. So we've just flipped this one over to match to the other side. And then based on the same vertex selection, we can then stack them on top of each other and we can compare sets of UVs then. So if we zoom in here, you'll see that there's a bit of a wobble there and that's because they're, they're slightly different as we toggle back and forth between the two. So we now have a match UVs function as well to be able to just snap those points so that they're completely symmetrical. So the other nice new feature we have in the UV toolkit is the ability to actually see a distortion map as you're adjusting your texture images. So you can see there this like pink and blue. As we move things out there, the, the more we go to white, you're able to see that you're not going to get stretching then on your images when you do that. And finally, the other side to the toolkit is symmetry is a big change that we've had uh, in Maya now so that you can paint the symmetry, or you can just hold down the control key and it will mirror pop the symmetry to the other side. So this is, is a nice new part to the toolkit that really simplifies the artist's workflow. So the next thing I wanted to talk about is our hair system, XGen. So this is just a short video showing uh, a groom artist doing their thing, and then we'll talk about how you can take some of this workflow and apply it to a games environment. So obviously, to take advantage of the hair, you would see, uh, or the rendered hair, you would be using things like Arnold to be able to get the full X-Gen experience in this case. But what we're seeing here is our interactive grooming tool. So this allows you, rather than to just try and guess what your hair is going to be doing with guide hairs, which used to be just thin splines that you'd be dealing with in the past, you can actually see all of this in the viewport now. 
And then to get this onto a games character, so we're looking at Geralt now. So this is an X-Gen hair groom. We want to actually build some hair cards, which is more how you would deal with um, hair in, in a game engine. So this is the flat polygon planes. So we'd start off with our hair groom here, and then we would go into our X-Gen panel on the side there, and we would create a, what we call a linear wire modifier. And then from here, we can actually add some thickness to each linear wire. So we, what we're doing is we're heavily reducing the number of hairs, we're widening them, and then that's how we can start to generate our hair cards. So XGen actually has a feature set now to allow you to actually convert these to polygons. And in the process of doing that, you're able to also um, procedurally generate the joints and skin them at the same time. So just in the interest of time, I'm going to jump forward a little bit. So you can use the full suite of um, sculpt tools. You can see here we're kind of cutting the length of the hairs. And then you can go in and sort of in individually start to refine these. So if we skip forward a bit, we've converted this to polys. And then you can choose things like the, the number of spans that you have there. Then you could apply your texture to this. So this is just a texture with a transparency map on there. And then you can add the joints as well. So this is actually the whole groom now. We've switched from the X-Gen one to our hair cards. But it really does just cut down the time it would take you to create these hair grooms uh, in a game's environment. So the other neat new feature we've had uh, in Maya this year, which I really want to talk about, because I think perhaps games users might not be aware of this, it's our Maya motion graphics tool set. So this comes in the form of MASH, but I'll be showing you in a second how it goes way beyond just motion graphics. So motion graphics, you would think of, oh, title sequences, that sort of thing. Why is that relevant to games? But the examples I've got to show you are, are really intriguing as to the different sorts of uses, whether it's procedural modeling or, or rigging. You can do all sorts of things like that in the MASH environment. But what it allows you to do is just to do complex things in a very short space of time. So it's using instances under the hood, so Maya instances. So this stuff can be baked out. And if your game engine can interpret instances, you can get a lot of this animation directly into your game engine. And also, you can bake out Olympics from MASH as well to allow you to get that into your game engine if it accepts your Olympics. So just to give you an idea of what MASH is, uh, in case you haven't heard of it before, it's, uh, as I said, a motion graphics tool set. And what I really like about MASH is it has a very simple, quite self-contained UI. So we've got this thing called the waiter on the side here. So each node is quite self-explanatory. So say you wanted to bring in some audio as a driver to do something in Maya, whether it's um, moving some geometry or perhaps rotating some joints, you can take all of these behaviors of your MASH network and use it to drive several different things in, inside of Maya. So one of the ones that I think is very relevant to games, and this is new to Maya Update 3, is our new placer node that comes as part of MASH. So this is the ab ability to essentially paint your instances where you want them to go. And what we're seeing here is our collision brush. So once you've painted them, you then paint with your collide brush, and you can see that they're all sort of moving out the way of each other, so they're not penetrating. Now you can also um, paint these um, with the strict collision turned on so that as you paint, it's also doing the collisions for you at the same time. So there's a couple of ways that you can do it. And so we'll paint here, and you'll see that already they're starting to avoid each other. So it gives you that real feel of art direction where you can just say, well, I've got this landscape, and I want to paint these wherever I want. You can delete, say you wanted a river to go through there. And you can even go in and select each instance individually. So if you need to modify groups of instances. So it's, it's a very efficient way of being able to generate these kinds of environments. So to take this a stage further, we've actually got the world node in MASH. Now, there's all sorts of crazy stuff going on under the hood here, but essentially it's a simulation system to allow you to procedurally map out an ecosystem of trees. So you would say, I want to have 
a 100-year simulation cycle. And there's all sorts of different uh, genome values that you can say, like the soil quality, the wind, the sunlight exposure. These trees are going to self-seed themselves every four years. And you just hit the run button, and it's going to generate this forest for you. And you can have multiple genotypes for the different types of trees that you might want to add here. And you can even say things like the wind factor is going to blow seeds across the river. So th there's all sorts of weird and wonderful things that you can do with MASH that you just wouldn't expect. So I'd say I think MASH was introduced in my 2016 extension too. So if you haven't used it yet, definitely have a play and see what you can do. So this is another example of MASH. Um, so as I said, I came from a rigging background. And I did a little experiment where I wanted to see how much of it I could do with the MASH network. So I had my single tank tread there. And using the curve node in MASH, I just wanted to build a little tank tread and then have it animate. So there's a little bit of rigging involved under the hood here. But if I wanted to then go in and modify that tank tread, I could do that, and it would update all of them procedurally. So the other thing I've done in this example here, I've got some rivets on the wheels. And I wanted to use MASH to be able to procedurally update those as well. So if we zoom in here, we see we've got these rivets. This is one I've done already. So that would just start off as a single rivet. And then part of the MASH network, you can do it as a radial function instead of a linear function. So then you can map this to a transform, and then it's going to follow what the wheels are doing. So this is a very high level overview. It's not sort of showing you what buttons to push. Um, I will be putting this as a more detailed tutorial on my YouTube channel. But then the other side that I enjoyed with MASH is the sort of heads up display style stuff here. And you know, traditionally this would have been really complicated to do in Maya and you can do this now in the space of about 10 minutes. So this just guides you through in a very sped up fashion how you would go about doing some kind of display like this. So we have an SVG node import now, which allows you to bring vector graphics directly in from um, packages like Adobe Illustrator. So we brought in that little fuel gauge. I'm going to set up a mesh network now with the uh, grid object or the plane object here. And I'm going to just start to animate what the fuel gauge is doing. And you can you know, change the scale, rotation, that sort of thing. And then what I'd like to do now is use little planes and treat them like pixels. So again, this is using a mesh network. And I'm going to influence the color of those planes with a fall off object. So by default, you would get an implicit sphere. So as I move it around, it's changing the color from black to blue. But then you can see I've used this geometry now in the scene to actually affect the color of each of those individual planes. So they're all just instances. So you could get this into a game engine, uh, particularly if it can interpret color vertex information. You could get the color side of it as well. And then this is the other thing that I had to play around with. So I did a simple little eye rig. So this is just using NURBS curves with some shapes on there, just driven by a rig control. And again, you can create a fall off object with that NURBS curve to kind of create your Wally or Eve style uh, eyes there. But what, what I like about this is that it, nothing's pre-baked. You know, you might have done this with pre-baked textures and things like that in the past. But this is really putting the control back in the hands of the animator so they can see these quite complex effects. And this is our final kind of rendered case study using uh, Arnold. So we just put a piece of glass over the top of that then to be able to kind of give it that TV screen effect. But it's this kind of case studies I wanted to bring your attention to really that, you know, MASH, yes, it's a motion graphics tool, but I think there's so many other uses for it that are definitely worth knowing about. So finally, I just very quickly wanted to show off Bifrost as well, our simulation system. And again, if your game engines can interpret Alembics, you can cache this stuff out as a piece of geometry. And this is our uh, ocean simulation system that we have in Maya now. So it's a mixture of geometry and fluid sim. So it's come on a long way in the, in the last few years. And the way you achieve this kind of thing is, is through something we call motion fields. And this uh, is basically art directable physics. So all the complicated stuff is taken care of for you, but you can still go in and start to do some really crazy stuff. So we could bake this out as an Alembic. Not so much the actual particle side at the moment. I don't believe this can be exported from Bifrost just yet. But these rolling wave effects here, all of that complex 
simulation is just taken care of by that particular motion field. Oops, not playing. And then finally, for those of you who are working in cinematics and uh, rendering, we just brought out Arnold 5. And this video is just a little showpiece showing you what's new and what's changed. So that's kind of it for today's presentation. Uh, as you can see, we've been quite busy with new features and things like that in the last couple of years. Um, I wanted to share this slide. Oh, it's cut off a bit at the end there. But I wanted to share this slide. Uh, feel free to take a picture of this if you're looking for resources and where to learn about some of these new features in more detail. Um, we've got all sorts of YouTube channels that are very useful. If you want to give Shotgun a try um, or find out more about it, come and have a chat to us on the booth. I'm happy to very quickly answer any questions uh, if there are any. But thank you for listening. Any questions? <laughs> Everyone's still tired from lunch. And <laughs> heavy night last night. Great. Okay, well, we're on the booth. Um, if you do want to pop by or, or give us your badge number on the way out, as I said, we do have an Autodesk goodie bag that we're looking to give out. Um, so I've got a couple of my colleagues there on the door or um, pop by the Autodesk booth and uh, we'll add you to the list. Thank you very much.